Uh, my name is Nirav Vora. I'm a vascular neurologist and neurointerventionalist at Riverside Methodist Hospital uh, here in Columbus, Ohio. And before we start our discussion, I just want to ex express my gratitude for all of you on the front line uh, for everything that you're doing uh, for our patient population, particularly in these uh, challenging times, but also uh, keeping your focus on all healthcare issues, not just uh, those related to pandemics and, and uh, the current uh, crisis. So with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and proceed. We can go to the next slide. So and we, we've learned a lot in the last year, um, or last few years about acute ischemic stroke, that uh, there are a lot of dramatic treatments that can be done with endovascular therapy to reverse an ischemic stroke. Uh, but Keep in mind that hemorrhagic stroke is still about 30% of the total stroke population. And when you look at the amount of disability and cost to our healthcare system, anywhere from about 60 to 70% of the cost to our healthcare system uh, comes from hemorrhagic strokes in terms of long term care. And so we really will make a greater dent. Uh, in uh, improving our healthcare system and cost to the system and in improving patients' lives if we are able to understand and treat hemorrhagic conditions more so. So as we look at this, there, there, there are a lot of different types of intracerebral hemorrhage. There's traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage and then there's hemorrhage within the brain tissue itself. So this slide is looking at the two different types of traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage. There's the epidural hemorrhage and a subdural hemorrhage. Now this is a side, uh, a coronal or a front facing view of the skull. And notice this little red line that under that goes just underneath the skull uh, level. That's the dura, that's the protective covering on the brain. And that line provides a, a specific demarcation for different types of traumatic hemorrhage. So you'll see on the left side of your screen, there's the middle meningeal artery. And sometimes when someone has a blow to the head, you can have shearing of this middle meningeal artery as it dips from going along the scalp and dips underneath the bone. And when you have shearing of this artery, you can develop what's called an epidural hemorrhage. So many times the patients will present with a uh, a blow to the head, maybe a baseball, maybe you know just falling off a ladder, and they land on the side of their head, and they seem completely fine. You may be called to see them, and the interaction is that they're doing okay, they're fine, they'll go about their business. But it's very important to get a head CT on these patients because immediately you may, they may not feel uh, any neurologic symptoms at all. But if that artery is sheared, that artery is accumulating pressure underneath the skull and above the dura. And once enough pressure is collected, the dura pushes in hard on the brain tissue and can cause dramatic changes in neurological function. Uh, the brain gets shifted over, and these can be, uh, once there's too much pressure, these can be uniformly fatal. But there's an opportunity to recognize this with a CAT scan and immediately get surgical treatment, which can be life-saving and almost re restore neurologic function or prevent any type of deterioration. So that's what an epidural hemorrhage is. They'll present initially uh, with that blow to the head but and feel fine, uh, but they still warrant a head CT because things can get uh, bad very fast. Now, on the other side of the screen, you'll see what's called a subdural hemorrhage. And that's where hemorrhage accumulates under the, under the bone and under the dura. If we go to the next uh, slide, uh, you can see that a subdural hematoma is caused by the rupture of small veins under the dura. And so this is very different from the epidural hematoma that we talked about. This is a slow progressive bleed. Uh, this slow progressive bleed uh, 
gradually over time causes neurologic issues, but it can cause stroke-like symptoms, it can cause seizures, and these are hemorrhages that tend to not go away uh, over time. Now, other things that can be uh, related to this would be trauma. Uh, people develop these over time as they get older because the veins start to rupture at older ages. Uh, if they're on anticoagulation, that can cause these uh, to start leaking out and, and bleeding. Now, if we can go back to the previous slide, Remember I mentioned the middle meningeal artery. Well, the middle meningeal artery plays a very significant role in both of these hemorrhages. So one, uh, if a patient has an epidural hemorrhage, the, the initial traumatic hemorrhage we talked about, it's because the, epi the middle meningeal artery has been damaged. Now, ordinarily you go through surgery and you would, you would uh, clip off that middle meningeal artery so it doesn't continue to bleed. Um, but also the middle meningeal artery feeds the dura and allows some of these these uh, uh, bridging veins, feeds the veins that are causing the subdural hemorrhages. And so a newer treatment that we have been performing at Riverside Hospital with our neurointerventional team has been to treat a subdural hematoma with surgery uh, and drain off that blood but then what we do is we go back in and we take out the middle meningeal artery. So we do an endovascular approach through the femoral artery in the leg, just like what's been done in the past with cardiology. And we go retrograde all the way up into the arteries of the face, into the middle meningeal artery, and we knock out that artery. And over time, you're going to see over the course of about three to six months, that subdural hematoma gradually recedes. So it gets absorbed by the body and it doesn't recollect. So this is a newer endovascular treatment that uh, is under study, but there are a lot of centers starting to do this nationally, and we're one of the first sites uh, within Central Ohio to provide this treatment. Now let's jump two slides over. We've talked about traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage, but now let's talk about hemorrhages that actually occur inside the brain tissue. So there's the perforator type bleed versus amyloid hemorrhage. And what, what do we mean by this? Well, it really depends on the location of where the hemorrhage is. A patient can have a brain hemorrhage within the tissue of the brain itself, and these can be peripherally located, so very close to the surface of the brain, or they can be in deep locations. Now, if you look at this picture, you'll see that there are, there's uh, several arteries that have been um, marcate, demarcated. And the arteries uh, under the heading of uh, the letter A, that's a very typical site for an amyloid hemorrhage. An amyloid hemorrhage is uh, a hemorrhage that occurs as the blood vessels within the periphery of the brain become very weak and over time, with uh, high blood pressure, these arteries start to leak along the surface of the brain. These are bad hemorrhages and they typically occur in our older patients, those who are over the age of 70 typically. But these will call little, cause little tiny bleeds along the surface of the brain that are, that are recurrent. They have a high chance of recurring. Uh, whereas if you look at captions B, C, D, and E, these are all what we call perforator hemorrhages. These are hemorrhages that occur in deep tissues within the brain. And it's because of those vascular risk factors that we commonly think of for stroke. So patients who have high blood pressure, patients who are smokers, those who have uncontrolled diabetes or high cholesterol develop teeny tiny little aneurysms within teeny tiny little uh, perforator blood vessels and they end up having uh, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Now interestingly, these are very different from ischemic stroke. Most of the time patients are going to present with some form of loss of consciousness and a severe headache. But sometimes they will present with uh, focal deficits, but 80% of the time you can expect these patients to have an alteration of consciousness and a headache as their initial presentation. We can go to the next slide. Contrast the previous picture of 
of an intracerebral hemorrhage with this CAT scan that you see here on the right side. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you've got hemorrhage within the brain tissue itself, and now this is a hemorrhage along the surface of the brain. And it spills into little gaps within within the uh, within the brain tissue, but also forms on the underneath surface of the brain and kind of trickles its way up to the top of the skull. So this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and the most common cause uh, is trauma. So a patient uh, can fall, a person can fall, hit their head, and you can get potentially these epidural hemorrhages or subdural hemorrhages, but you can also get subarachnoid hemorrhages. But what we commonly worry about are those aneurysms, I'm sorry, those uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages that are caused by an intracranial aneurysm. So what's very important about subarachnoid hemorrhage is how they present. Many times these patients are awake and they're just telling you, they're presenting to you with the complaint that this is the worst headache of their life, okay? Um, and as as soon as they make that complaint, what you want to do is get a little bit more history to find out what brought on this worst headache of their life. Many times it's after sexual activity. Uh, sometimes it's after exercise. We see this many times in people who are doing very aggressive weightlifting or very aggressive aerobic exercise is that they all of a sudden have a severe headache, many times with nausea, many times with neck pain. And that's a harbinger of a subarachnoid hemorrhage that has to be evaluated, particularly, uh, particularly if, if there's been some form of activity, we've got to get a CAT scan to make sure this is not a ruptured aneurysm because the complications of a ruptured aneurysm can be pretty severe. Other things that present w alongside the headache uh, and nausea and neck pain are cranial nerve palsy. So it's very important to do a neuro assessment to make sure that the extraocular muscles are intact, making sure that both eyes are moving together in tandem all the way the corner the left corner of both eye eyelid or uh, or orbits, eye sockets. Uh, they're moving to the left and to the right. If there's any suggestion that the eyes aren't moving in tandem, this very well may be a subarachnoid hemorrhage or an ruptured aneurysm, and that needs to be evaluated. The other important cranial nerve palsy to look for in a subarachnoid hemorrhage is the size of the pupil. If there is, an, if there is even the slightest uh, discrepancy in the size of the pupil, then that may suggest that there's a large aneurysm that is compressing the nerves um, to the brainstem and is an impending sign of a patient who could re-rupture again. So these are important clinical signs that whenever you're getting called about a patient who had a trauma or is having a headache, that we make sure that you screen for this because that's the first sign of something that may worsen, uh, again, uh, with, with uh, an intracranial bleed. Remember, subarachnoid hemorrhage due to aneurysm is fairly common. About one in 1,000 have aneurysms within the brain, and about one in 10,000 will have a rupture. So we, we would expect to see many people with the aneurysms and have a high risk of rupture. About a third of the patients who have a ruptured aneurysm do not make it to the hospital. Either they die in their sleep and they're found later on, on uh, autopsy to have had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, or sometimes patients deteriorate before they even make it to the hospital. So uh, as quickly as we can make uh, the diagnosis or recognize the possibility of an intracranial bleed, we can flip that number and make that a much smaller uh, number and improve patient outcome. Some things that will also increase your risk would be patients who have a history of cigarette smoking or cystic kidney disease, or if they've had a family history of aneurysm. So, uh, you know, someone who's complaining of a new headache, worst headache of their life, uh, there's not been any trauma, but there's been a, a 
a history of some sort of uh, exertion, um, and they've had a family member who died from an aneurysm in the brain, uh, that patient, even if they say they're feeling okay and they don't need to come in to the emergency room, I would strongly encourage them to come in because we need to make sure that they don't have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Subarachnoid hemorrhage from aneurysm typically occurs at the branch points of blood vessels within the brain. And so on, on this slide, you're seeing some of the common sites within the brain where aneurysms form. And you'll notice the typical pattern is that wherever you see a branch point within the main arteries of the brain, uh, these aneurysms are forming. And that's because the artery wall weakens. And as the artery wall weakens, the, you get an outpouching of the, of the blood vessel forming this aneurysm. And just like any type of balloon, as, as these get larger and larger, the wall of the balloon gets thinner and thinner. And with weakening of the blood vessel because of cigarette smoking or because of a high, high blood pressure or all of a sudden a sudden increase in pressure in the brain when you have some form of exertion, you get a small pop of the vessel of that aneurysm and then it seals itself off. So it's not, a, it's not a situation where you have continuous bleeding, but you have a small pop. And that pressure and blood that's released initially uh, can cause coma, can cause the symptoms of neck pain, uh, severe nausea because blood within the brain is so irritating uh, and can cause those symptoms. But if there's high pressure that's released, that pressure can cause coma and also other complications uh, uh, within the brain tissue, such as uh, a major uh, clot forming within the brain and causing pressure and compression of vital brain structures. Let's skip two more slides over. And this should be a slide that shows a picture of the eyeball on the left side and some brain structures following. Now, I mentioned before that when you're looking for a patient who has a subarachnoid hemorrhage, sometimes you'll get a discrepancy in the size of the pupil. And, and that, I think it's important to understand that because that, that really gives you a sense of, of, uh, of picking up a, a, an aneurysm that's, that's apt to re-rupture. So if you have a patient who's complaining of headaches and and as you evaluate them and you see that they're having uh, a difference in the size of one pupil, why is that? Um, well, if you look to the back side of that picture, towards the right side of the screen, you're gonna see a purple line coursing through the back. That's your oculomotor nerve. That's your third cranial nerve. And many of you may remember this, this anatomic study, but just bear with me as we go back over it. The, Ocular motor nerve actually controls majority of eye movement, but it also controls our pupillary uh, response. So when you shine a light in the pupil, it causes the pupil to constrict. Uh, and it does that through parasympathetic fibers. Now, if you've got an aneurysm from the carotid artery, that aneurysm, as it expands, can start to compress the uh, oculomotor nerve or the third cranial nerve. And when you're compressing the oculomotor nerve from the outside, you're going to compress those parasympathetic fibers, which means they don't work anymore. And because if they're not if they're not working, then that means your sympathetic fibers along that nerve are working unopposed, and so the pupil dilates. So all of a sudden you'll have one eye that looks like the patient's been to the eye doctor and they dilated the eye and it's huge, a huge pupil. And the other side looks totally normal and they're complaining of a headache. And in that scenario, that's an aneurysm that is impending a rupture um, and that needs to be evaluated. So, you know, for those of you know, if you are in a location where you have a neurointerventional center uh, 
I strongly urge that those patients with those findings go to a neurointerventional center immediately. But you can always go to your local uh, uh, local center. So, for example, our colleagues in in Delaware County, Delaware, you can always go to Grady Health Center where they can be evaluated by our neuro team through telemedicine. We'll get them down to Riverside uh, uh, for uh, neurointerventional consultation right away. But these are patients that we would probably take for an urgent uh, endovascular treatment regardless of time of day uh, because the risk of rupture is so high. So how do we diagnose? We can go to the next slide. How do we diagnose intracerebral hemorrhage and particularly subarachnoid hemorrhage? So really one, first of all, it's the clinical syndrome. You get that history of uh, the worst headache of their life or loss of consciousness, that's going to prompt us to get a head CT right away. Um, now, if the story fits and the head CT isn't very revealing, then we're going to get a lumbar puncture because we got to look for the si sort of side of blood. Now, most of the time we'll catch things with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, but if not, we go to a lumbar puncture. Uh, and that may be a very common a uh, question that sh shows up on CME exams and, and board questions, or wh wh what is the diagnostic for a subarachnoid hemorrhage? If, you, if the CT scan is negative, does that mean that they don't have a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, no, if the story is good, then we're gonna look for um, blood in, in a lumbar puncture and make sure that there's no blood product within, that, uh, within the spinal fluid. And once we find that, we're going to go straight to catheter-based angiography to look for the aneurysm and determine what the treatment protocol is going to be for that patient. A common question, we go to the next slide. A common question that 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 we often encounter is, well, we've got this patient, we you know, they seem clinically consistent with some type of intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, uh, in the field, what do we do with their blood pressure? Because it may take you 15 minutes uh, or so to get to your uh, closest center. It may take a little bit uh, longer to get to your comprehensive center. But what do you do in those critical moments? Uh, in those, what do you do in those critical moments in terms of managing their blood pressure? Because that's so important. Plus, it's also problematic when you don't know what type of stroke process do they have. Could they be having an ischemic stroke? And do you want to drop the blood pressure? Do you want to raise the blood pressure? So, you know, when you're dealing with an ischemic stroke, the most common presentation is going to be a focal deficit. Uh, remember, that can happen 20% of the time when you have an intracerebral hemorrhage. So you can't rely on that completely. But if you drop the blood pressure in an ischemic stroke, you may worsen their ischemia uh, because the collateral flow isn't uh, supporting the brain tissue. But if you drop the pressure in, a, in an intracerebral hemorrhage, you actually help the patient out because you prevent the hemorrhage from expanding. So the question is, what do you do in, in this scenario? Uh, well, there have been studies uh, there have been studies that have shown uh, that at different levels of blood pressure, uh, at different levels of systolic blood pressure, what happens to an intracerebral hemorrhage. And when you get to an inter when you have an intracerebral hemorrhage patient and you drop the systolic blood pressure less than 140, when you drop the systolic blood pressure less than 140, you actually end up causing other secondary injuries, particularly uh, acute renal failure or acute coronary ischemia. And because of that, we've actually started to tolerate a little bit higher blood pressure than what we used to do. So if you go back five, six years, we were trying to be, and, and most guidelines from the American Heart Association were, try, were trying to push the systolic blood pressure down as as uh, rapidly as possible and as aggressively as possible. And now with good prospective studies, uh, the most recent one was the ATTACH study, uh, 
the ATTACH, the ATTACH study showed that uh, rapid aggressive blood pressure reduction actually does more secondary systemic harm uh, for the patient. And so we're really looking for a blood pressure and that w systolic blood pressure of 140 to 160. That keeps, um, now, without knowing whether you have a patient that's having an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, that systolic blood pressure of 140 to 160 keeps the mean arterial blood pressure within a certain range that maintains perfusion pressure within the brain, but prevents the hemorrhage from expanding dramatically. We can go to the next slide. And preventing expansion of the intracerebral hemorrhage is the name of the game. So that we really don't have at this point any medical treatment for an intracerebral hemorrhage other than reversing any, any anticoagulants that the patient may be on and also keeping the blood pressure within a controlled range. Now, there have been some studies looking at medications such as a recombinant factor eight, which is uh, a clotting factor, and these haven't been successful, although there's now a new initiative to uh, start uh, a new study using recombinant factor eight. So recombinant factor eight is a clotting factor that can be given um, intravenously and think of patients who have hemophilia who are born without certain clotting factors. They get, they have treatments where they're given infusions of, of clotting factor so that uh, they can stop bleeding. But in a patient who has otherwise normal coagulation, if you give them a bolus dose of factor eight, you can actually cause, uh, you can actually create uh, thrombosis and prevent a hemorrhage from expanding. Now, about a decade ago, uh, there was a study called the FAST study, which used recombinant factor eight, and it used uh, that medication uh, for patients who presented with an intracerebral hemorrhage out to about six to eight hours. And there was no benefit in those patients at all using factor eight. But when you go back and you look at that study, when patients got their factor eight within the first three hours of their intracerebral hemorrhage, you saw about a 30% reduction in the size of their uh, intracerebral hemorrhage compared to those patients who had expansion. So think of where we were about 20 years ago with TPA we recognize that if you give TPA quickly in the setting of an acute ischemic stroke, you could prevent the, you could dissolve the clot that's blocked uh, blood flow in the brain and prevent the stroke from expanding. Now we're thinking that factor eight is the new TPA, if you will, and we can give this medication within the first three hours to reduce the size of, of a hemorrhage. So that's going to be the focus of what we call the fastest trial. That will be being that will be run through our uh, mobile stroke treatment unit that we have for the city of Columbus, and it may be an opportunity for us to increase our collaboration uh, with our colleagues in Delaware County and Delaware City EMS. Where if you have a patient that you have a suspected uh, potential stroke that needs to be transferred, or a patient who has uh, uh, symptoms of, a, of an intracerebral hemorrhage, we can potentially work on a way to collaborate and get find a rendezvous point with our mobile stroke unit and where the patient could be considered for the FASTA study. We can go to the next slide. Remember, the name of the game is controlling the size of the intracerebral hemorrhage. So your chance of mortality is under 20% if your hemorrhage is under 30 cc's. Now, every hemorrhage, if they go untreated, will expand in volume by anywhere from 30 to 50% in size in the first 24 hours. So if we're able to initiate a treatment for patients within the first three hours of their hemorrhage, we can prevent that hemorrhage from increasing because as you see, 
as you go from a 30 cc hemorrhage to over a 60 cc hemorrhage, mortality increases dramatically. We can go to the next slide. Now, like I mentioned, most of these patients who are candidates for the fastest study are going to be patients who have their intracerebral hemorrhage discovered within the first three hours. Now, that's not every patient. And uh, we know after going through our experience with acute ischemic stroke, initially for the first 10 years or so with this medication, only 1% of the population was actually eligible until we started looking for ways to expand the indication and, and, and to really get better education to the community. So what treatments do we have for a parenchymal intracerebral hemorrhage uh, beyond three hours? Well, there are new surgical treatments. Uh, surgery has been done uh, for decades uh, in patients who have intracerebral hemorrhage, and this has largely been, been considered a life-saving treatment but many times will save the patient's life with uh, emergent surgery, but their outcome is pretty dismal. Um, so we need better treatments and treatments that are quicker and more minimally invasive. At Riverside Methodist, we've been part of the International Enriched Study, which is uh, the use of this new uh, catheter that can be delivered into the brain itself and then allow for rapid aspiration of the clot. So if you have a hemorrhage that is peripheral and reaching very close to the surface of the brain, out to about 10 to 12 hours after the onset of the hemorrhage, you can have a surgical procedure performed using this catheter, and you can see that on the right side of your screen, called the NICO catheter. It looks like a rocket ship, and but what it has is a, a soft tip with a beveled edge that can tunnel through brain tissue, and, but it's very atraumatic and it doesn't cause uh, disruption of the, of the white matter and all the neurofibers underlying uh, the brain tissue. And so once you insert this uh, NICO catheter, it has, it, it's basically, um, a conduit to allow someone to place, a surgeon, neurosurgeon, to place a an aspiration catheter and to drain out much of the hemorrhage. And then once you drain out the hemorrhage, one, you prevent this hemorrhage from expanding over the course of the next uh, 12 to 24 hours. And you also reduce some of the secondary effects of uh, the toxic effects of having that clot within the brain tissue itself. So this is a study is underway. Actually, it's anticipated that this study will probably be completed within the next six months. So we hope maybe maybe then I can come back to this group and report out that this is a new treatment that, that has shown uh, benefit for intracerebral hemorrhage patients. But it's pretty exciting to be part of this international study. We can go to the next slide. And we've talked a lot about new treatments for uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, but what about for subarachnoid aneurysm hemorrhage? So, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the remainder of this discussion. So, there have been there there are really two different types of treatment. One is open surgical treatment with clipping, and you can see that uh, image on the left side of your screen, where the surgeon would do a craniotomy and open uh, and retract brain tissue down to the side of the aneurysm itself, and then place this clip, uh, a surgical clip made from titanium that basically is like a clothespin, and it seals off the aneurysm itself. That surgery has been around now. It's, I think 2020 celebrates uh, 100 years of surgical clipping. So it's been around for a long time. Now, a treatment that's been around for about 25 years now is, some, is called endovascular coiling. And what this is, and you can see on the, on the right side of your picture, is that a catheter is inserted via the femoral artery and is taken all the way up into the aneurysm sac itself 
And through this hollow catheter, we release little strings of platinum. And these strings of platinum basically unravel and unfold inside the aneurysm, treat, inside that aneurysm or that sac of the blood vessel. And once the coils of platinum are released, they cause the blood flow inside that aneurysm to start clotting off. So once the blood flow inside the aneurysm clots off, uh, you can't rupture the aneurysm because there's no pressure coming in into that structure. So these two treatments have been the mainstay of aneurysm treatment for the last 25 years. And really about 10 to 15 years ago, we can go to the next slide. On, the next, on this slide, we'll show you some data from the international subarachnoid treatment study from England. Uh, this is data from uh, a study done in 2003, so it's almost 20 years old. Uh, but this study showed when you went head-to-head -head between clipping and coiling, that patients who had coiling had less disability. So the endovascular arm had 24% disability or death compared to about 30, 31% of patients who actually had the surgical clipping. And so since that time, there's been a shift towards more patients being treated with a coiling procedure when they have a ruptured aneurysm. But what's important is that you've got to have a center that's experienced in doing both because there are some aneurysms that we cannot treat with endovascular treatment, and there are many aneurysms that you can't clip. But what you want to have is the expertise to manage both, and also you want to have neurocritical care that can manage the uh, secondary issues that arise from treatment of, of both of these types of procedures. This, like I mentioned, this was a European study recently in, here in North America, about five years or so. Uh, the Barrow Neurological Institute out of Phoenix, Arizona, repeated this entire study and found the exact same results. So it, so it seems that when you're retracting uh, a sick brain, a swollen brain from the hemorrhage, a uh, brain that's been hit with uh, high pressures from a rupture, when you're not retracting that and treating the aneurysm through an endovascular approach, this minimally invasive approach has Uh, this minimally invasive approach uh, has uh, resulted in less disability for our patients. Now, over time, endovascular treatment, if you see the bottom of the slide here, uh, endovascular treatment has continued to evolve. So many of the aneurysms that were treated in the uh, study, the ISAP study that I mentioned already, um, Many of those aneurysms were small, narrow aneurysm, but now big, wide, broad aneurysms um, are being treated with uh, techniques such as placing a balloon uh, in the parent vessel itself and sealing off the main blood vessel as you kind of force and jam more coils up into the aneurysm or using a stent and creating an artificial barrier to keep your coiling structure all inside the aneurysm itself. So endovascular treatment has gone through a lot of newer uh, evolutions. And if we can go to the next slide, this slide will talk about flow diversion embolization. So one, one of the risks with endovascular treatment has been the potential that you can rupture the aneurysm. Now, rupture of the aneurysm occurs also with surgical clipping, but when you rupture the aneurysm with surgical clipping, the surgeon is right there to just seal it off. And if you have a rupture during the endovascular treatment, well, there's a po the possibility that uh, that aneurysm still is leaking until you know for some time until you can get complete control of the blood vessel so is there a way of treating an aneurysm without even entering inside the aneurysm itself and and over the last few years we've developed a, there's been a development in technology called flow diversion so using a device called the pipeline embolization stent or pipeline embolization device 
basically you've created a stent that is tightly wound almost I like to use the term of a, it looks like a slinky and this stent is so tightly wound that it has very small porous holes and it prevents flow from getting into the aneurysm itself. So you actually can avoid entering an aneurysm entirely and deploy the stent on the outside of the aneurysm within the main blood vessel and it prevents blood flow from entering the aneurysm and so over time the aneurysm shuts down and you've essentially accomplished the same goal as if you were trying to clip the aneurysm or coil the aneurysm. I'll give you an example of this you can see on the next slide, this is an uh, example of a patient who has an aneurysm. You can see where the red arrow is pointing to a small aneurysm uh, that's pointing towards the middle of the screen. And that's, in a, that's in an area called the hypophyseal region, so supplying the uh, base of the brain. And that's a very tough spot to get to for either uh, surgical clipping because it's very close to the skull base and so there's a lot of bone that has to uh, be uh, deconstructed to reach that site. And it's also right at the turn of, an inter of the internal carotid artery, so it's very tough for coiling as well. But with this evolution uh, of endovascular treatment using flow diversion, we don't have to worry about it. We can just keep our catheters within the main blood vessel. So the the next slide, the the, the next uh, uh, picture on that slide, on the top screen, the top half of the screen, you'll faintly see kind of the outline of the stent itself. And over time, you can see on the bottom screen, or the bottom part of the screen that that aneurysm that was pooching out before is now completely gone because now with that endovascular construct within the blood vessel, you get new endothelial blood vessels layering in and covering over the holes of the aneurysm as that aneurysm shuts down. And so this is a very nice treatment that we can use for small blister aneurysms and tough to reach aneurysms and has allowed us to, to treat uh, patients in a much more safer way. We can go to the next slide. Let's keep in mind that over time, minimally invasive uh, treatments have allowed us not only to uh, to treat uh, in a simpler way, but also in a faster way. So, the, so if you look at the evolution over the last hundred years with aneurysm treatment, an aneurysm surgical procedure, so a clipping procedure, lasts somewhere around eight hours. Uh, a coiling procedure maybe gets us down to about two hours, maybe three hours. But now a new form of endovascular treatment called intrasacular treatment allows us to do the same aneurysm treatment and that, that actually is now down to the range of minutes. So what intrasacular treatment is it allows us to place one construct inside the aneurysm. So for some aneurysms, we have to coil, but if they're nice, if they're wide aneurysms, we always have the concern that the coil will slip out of the aneurysm and potentially cause a stroke. And so we have to consider pla placing the patient on antiplatelet agents in the setting of a bleed in the brain and then placing a stent within the artery and increasing the risk of potential complication. And there's also the risk of introducing more than one device within the aneurysm itself. So what intrasacular treatment is, and we can go to the next slide, has been pioneered with this device called the woven endobridge or the web device. And what this is is a single delivery of a basket that's made from similar material as the, the pipeline device outside the blood vessel. We now insert it inside the blood vessel and at the base of the aneurysm, you're able to seal off the neck uh, or the opening to that aneurysm itself. 
We can go to the next slide, and you're going to see a series of four pictures of a basal or artery aneurysm. So this is a basal or artery aneurysm, uh, very difficult to reach from a surgical standpoint, and a little bit wide on this image, so a be the best and safest treatment from a coiling perspective would require additional uh, treatments with a stent. Now, if you look at the first picture in the screen in the top left-hand corner, you'll see the aneurysm. Uh, then the, the top right-hand corner, you'll see us approach that aneurysm with a catheter. You'll see that dot at the, at the base of the aneurysm there. In the bottom, left-hand corner, you'll see the web device being deployed. So what happens is this catheter is hollow, and through that catheter, we release the web device or the basket, and you'll see it start to unfold. The bottom right-hand corner shows how it's unfolding even more inside the aneurysm, and we can go to the next slide. And on the next slide, you'll see the entire, the, the entire web device unfolds within the aneurysm, and it's measured direct, directly to the size of its aneurysm, so it's customed for that particular aneurysm. And as it releases inside the aneurysm, uh, uh, we detach the device, and in the bottom part of the, your screen, you're going to see the final result, and that's at 24 hours. So you can see that the aneurysm can be can be treated very quickly uh, with an intrasacular treatment. And remember I said eight hours for a surgical clipping procedure, two to three hours for a coiling procedure. This procedure was 20 minutes. So dramatic changes in terms of uh, not only can minimally invasive reduce the amount of uh, uh, surgical time uh, or surgical uh, the amount of surgery that you have to do in terms of brain retraction, but it also reduces the amount of anesthesia time, ra um, radiation exposure time, and, and that uh, makes a huge difference. We can go to the next slide. This is an example of a patient recently who presented to Riverside Methodist who had a large nine millimeter middle cerebral artery aneurysm and this patient had severe COPD, and we had severe concerns, or significant concerns about placing this patient uh, on a ventilator. Uh, she did not have COVID, but we certainly wanted to minimize her exposure in the hospital to uh, COVID uh, and just ICU management, and we were afraid that we would have to keep her on the ventilator for quite a bit of time, and that's one reason the surgeons felt that she was not a good candidate for surgical clipping. And so we decided to go with endovascular. Now, one of the challenges if we wanted to coil this aneurysm is you'll see at the bottom of that aneurysm, there's a branch of the middle cerebral artery coming out of that almost right at about six o'clock. Now, this is a two-dimensional image and what you can't appreciate but what was the case for this patient's aneurysm is that that branch is coming off the backside of the, of the aneurysm. And so if we're trying to coil this aneurysm, we can't really see the backside of this aneurysm, or I'm sorry, the backside of the, uh, of the, of the aneurysm and see that branch. And so there's a high chance that we would, with coils, fill up the aneurysm, but fill up and close off that branch. So we use the web device uh, because you can measure off of this two-dimensional picture and shorten your web device so it can land just at the right spot and keep the back wall of that blood vessel open. You can see on the right side of the screen uh, that the aneurysm is now sealed. You can see the two dots on that screen give you the outline of your web device and then the artery remains open um, on the back side of the aneurysm wall. And again, this was a 20-minute procedure as opposed to what would have been a complicated 
uh, open surgical or endovascular coiling case. So the the opportunities for us to treat more aneurysms in a quicker way, safer way, um, have, have just continued to evolve. So we go to the last slide here, and we can just, in terms of, we want to summarize what our discussion today uh, was about. Well, first of all, you know, keep in mind intracerebral hemorrhage is a, a very significant diagnosis with a lot of morbidity and mortality, and we can make a great impact for patient income. Uh, I'm sure patient outcome, excuse me, uh, by focusing on the history, focusing on the examination, uh, and don't forget to look at the pupils. Uh, that's going to tell you a lot in terms of what's going on with this patient's uh, examination. Always try to avoid hypotension, avoid dropping the blood pressure dramatically. If that blood pressure is really high above systolic 220, bring it down slowly and slowly try to get to a goal of about 140 to 160. That will keep that patient safe regardless of what the diagnosis is, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic until they get to their until they get to the stroke center. It's very important that we know what anticoagulant the patient is on. That's going to impact whether uh, or how we treat an ischemic stroke or a, a hemorrhagic stroke. And keep in mind that we are now able to do very minimally invasive treatments for intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, but also subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, there are more and more uh, uh, evolutions to treating aneurysms that we didn't think we could before, uh, and uh, the you know the the opportunities are are still growing. And uh, uh, we appreciate the collaboration that we've had with our EMS colleagues, and we're looking forward to future collaborations as well. Thank you.